Hello students, nice to meet you again in our biology program. Today we are going to talk about the motor unit. So please concentrate with me. Let's start. Also the skeletal system includes the cartilages, joints, ligaments and tendons. Cartilages. Let's see cartilages. Type of connective tissue consists of cartilage cells. This is the definition of cartilages. Mostly found at tip of bones, especially at joints and between vertebra of vertebral column to protect bone from erosion by friction. Cartilage is found in ear, nose, and trachea. Cartilage does not contain blood vessel. Any cartilage does not contain blood vessel. So, it gets food and oxygen by diffusion. Let's talk about joints. There are three types of joints in a skeletal system. First, fibrous joints. Bones are fused by fibrous tissue in these joints and it can't move. By aging fibrous tissue change to bony tissue, these joints join bones of a skull by its serrated tips. As you see, it cannot move, so the fibrous joints cannot move. Another type, cartilaginous joints. They connect the ends of adjacent bones and are limited movable joints. For example, cartilages between vertebral column. The cartilage between vertebral column, I mean between vertebra, it's a kind of cartilaginous joints. The last type of joints, synovial joints. They are most of the body joints. The bones which touched by these joints are covered by thin cartilage substance. Also these bones are smooth, so bones can move easily with less friction and they are flexible joints, can bear shocks. These joints have serious or synovial fluid to ease their sliding and it cover tips of bones. For example, on synovial joints, elbow and knee joints, they are limited movable joints. They allow bones to move in one direction only. Shoulder and hip joints, they are widely movable joints, allow bones to move in many directions. I am going to revise that again. I am talking about joints and we have three types of joints. Fibrous joints, cartilaginous, and synovial joints. The fibrous cannot move. We find them in skull by its serrated bones, which we talked about them. Cartilaginous joints join ends in between vertebra. But synovial joints are two types, which are elbow and knee joints, which are limited movable joint, while shoulder and hip which considered widely movable joints. Now let's talk about ligaments. As you see they are bundles of fibrous connective tissue. Its tips are fixed on bones of joints. It connects bones at the point of connection. At joints also it determines movement of joints in different directions. The ligaments fibers are strong and they are flexible to allow its elongation without cutting by outer pressure. In some cases, ligaments tear due to its twisting like cruciate ligament in knee joint, as you see. Number four, tendons. They are strong connective tissue can bend muscles and bones 
at joints so they allow movement at contraction and relaxation of muscles. For example, Achilles tendon, which connect twin muscle by heel bone. Sometimes this tendon tear due to vigorous effort or sudden muscle fatigue or inability in muscles. From symptoms of tearing in Achilles tendon, inability of walking with severe pain, it can be treated by anti-inflammation medicine or using medical splint, but medical interaction happen only in complete tearing tendon. Now, let's move to support in man. We talked about support in plant. Now we are going to talk about support in man. The skeletal system of man. The skeletal system of man consists of an axis called the vertebral column attached at its upper end with the skull. Once again, the skeleton of man consists of an axis called vertebral column attached at its upper end with the skull, also connected to the thoracic cage and the four limbs through the shoulder bones and two lower limbs through pelvis bones. As we said, the skeletal system in man divided into two parts. Let's see axial skeleton and also appendicular skeleton. Axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton divided into three main parts, which are skull, vertebral column, and thoracic cage. Once again, axial skeleton consists of three main parts, skull, vertebral column, thoracic cage. And appendicular skeleton consists of four parts, pectoral girdle, four limbs, pelvic girdle and hind limbs. Once again, appendicular skeleton consists of four parts, pectoral girdle, four limbs, pelvic girdle and hind limbs. So we talked about that the skeletal system consists of two main parts, axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. And we recognize the parts of axial skeleton and parts of appendicular skeleton. So, now we are going to talk about each part in skeletal system. The vertebral column. As you see, the vertebral column consists of 33 vertebra, 7 cervical vertebra of moderate size, also 12 thoracic vertebra, larger than cervical, larger than cervical. And also you can see 5 lumbar vertebra. They are the largest and present in abdominal region. And also you can see five sacral vertebra. They are bored, flat, and fused. And also we have four coccygeal vertebra, which are small and diffused. They are the last vertebra. Once again, we are going to talk about the structure of vertebral column. As you see, consists of 33 vertebra, 7 cervical vertebra of moderate size, also 12 thoracic vertebra, larger than cervical, 5 lumbar vertebra, which are the largest and present in abdominal region. As you see, 5 sacral vertebra, which are broad, flat, and fused. And also, the last ones are 
four coccygeal vertebra which are small and fused. The skull or the cranium is a bony case consists of two parts. First, posterior part or cerebral part. Posterior part or cerebral part. And consists of eight bones connected together and its posterior contains a big foramen magnum through which the spinal cord is connected to the brain. So the big foramen magnum connect between spinal cord and the brain. It's an opening, it's an opening through which spinal cord is connected to the brain. As you see, it's position in posterior part of skull. Second part is anterior part or facial part. It has two jaws and the positions of sense organs. So the skull has two parts, which is posterior part and anterior part. Posterior part is called cerebral part and anterior part is called facial part. Let's move to another part of axial skeleton, which is the thoracic cage. The thoracic cage consists of three main parts, 12 vertebra, which are thoracic vertebra, 12 vertebra, which are thoracic vertebra, also sternum, and 12 pairs of ribs. Once again, the thoracic cage consists of 12 vertebra, sternum, and 12 pairs of ribs. The thoracic cage connected from posterior to the 12 thoracic vertebra and anteriorly to the sternum. The sternum is a flat bone pointed at its lower part, which is cartilaginous, as you see. It consists of, I mean the thoracic cage, consists of 12 pairs of ribs. Only 10 pairs are connected to the sternum. The remaining two pairs are called floating ribs, which are short and don't reach the sternum. Observe with me, my dear student, the rib is a curved bone attached posteriorly to the centrum of the vertebra and its transverse process. During inspiration, the ribs move anteriorly and laterally to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity and vice versa, of course, happen during expiration. Movement in living organisms. The living organism has self-movement and can respond to external stimuli. Once again, the living organism has self-movement and can respond to external stimuli. Movement types. Let's see what are different types of movement. As you see, first is biotic activity or continuous motion, such as cytoplasmic streaming. Also, we have a positional movement of some organs, such as prestalsis in vertebrate intestines and the movement of insectivorous plant leaves. At last we have total motion. Once again, let's see different types of motion. First, biotic activities or you can say, my dear students, continuous motion such as cytoplasmic streaming. And also we have Positional movement of some organs, such as prestalsis in vertebrate intestines, and the movement of insectivorous plant leaves. And the last one is total movement. And also now we are going to talk about different types of support. Support may be external, as in arthropods or internal as invertebrate. So we have external support 
and internal support. External support like arthropods and internal like vertebrates. The internal skeleton may be cartilaginous, as in cartilage fish, or may be bony, as in bony fish. It consists of segments attached by joints to facilitate movement. So, the internal skeleton may be made of cartilage or bones, and it's divided into segments attached by joints to facilitate the movement. First, I'm going to talk about movement implant. Let's see. Movement implant, as you see, different types like touch, sleep, tropism, haptotropism, or cytoplasmic streaming. And the movement of plant affected by touch, like you see, it's a mimosa plant. Look at this film carefully. You can see the leaves of this plant and some legumes plant partially closed. You can see these leaves are closed during darkness and return back to their original position with light. Let's see the affecting of plant to the touch. You can see mimosa plant. You can see its leaves of this plant of course and some legumes partially close their leaves during darkness and then they return back to their original position with light. Now I am going to talk about second type of movement in plant which is haptotropism or pulling movement. Tendrils of pea plant. A tendril raises itself into air and is likely to make contact with a solid object, as you see. Its length decreases and so the plant stem approaches the support and grows vertically. Let's see this, that again. Let's say that again. Tendrils like pea plant. The tendril, as you see, raises itself into the air and is likely to make contact with a solid object. Its length decreases, and so the plant stem approaches the support and grows vertically. If the tendril does not meet a support, it welts and dies, as you see. The twinning of the tendril is due to slow growth of the side in contact with the support, and acceleration of growth on the side of the tendril away from the support. This leads to elongation of the far side and so the tendril twins around the support. Once again, let's see that again. If the tendril does not meet a support, it welts and dies. The twinning of the tendril is due to slow growth on the side in contact with the support and accelerated gloss on the side of the tendril away from the support. This leads to elongation of the far side and so the tendril twins around the support as you see. This is the first type of haptotropism. Let's move to the second type of haptotropism. Corms and bulbs have pulling roots below them, as you see. Subterranean storing stems remain at a suitable distance from the soil surface by the help of these pulling roots, of course to support aerial part against wind effect. Once again, the second type of haptotropism, I mean pulling movement, corms and bulbs. They have pulling roots. Below them, subterranean storing stems remain at suitable distance from the soil surface by the help of these pulling roots. Now let's move to the movement 
of man. We can see movement in man. As you see, it depends on three systems, which are the skeletal system, which support the movement of limbs, the muscular system for contraction and relaxation of muscles that move the limbs, and the nervous system, which give the order to the muscles to contract and relax. Once again, the movement in man, as you see, the movement depends on three systems, which are the skeletal system, which support the movement of limbs, the muscular system, which, co which make contraction and relaxation of the muscles that move the limbs by turn, and the nervous system, which gives the order, the nervous system gives the order to muscles to contract and relax. Let's see the muscular system. The muscular system is a group of body muscles by which different parts of body can move. The unit of structure of muscular system is the muscle. The muscle consists of muscle tissue and usually known as flesh. The number of muscles in man is about 620 muscles or more. Now, I am going to say the general structure of muscular system again. The muscular system is a group of body muscles by which different parts of body can move. The unit of structure of muscular system is the muscle. The muscle consists of muscle tissue and usually known as flesh. The number of muscles in man is about 620 muscles or more. In skeletal muscles, the external surface of muscle fiber membrane is positively charged, and the internal surface, which is negatively charged. The potential difference is due to the difference in the ionic concentrations between outside and inside the membrane. As I said, the potential difference is due to the difference in ionic concentrations between outside and inside the membrane. The stimulus for muscle contraction is then arrival of nerve impulses through the motor nerve coming from the brain and spinal cord, the ends of which are enclosed to the muscle fibers forming a synapse. This area which you see is called synapse. The nerve endings contain vesicles filled with chemical substances called the neurotransmitters or acetylcholine. On the arrival of nerve impulse to nerve ending, it results in the release of neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitters are called acetylcholine from the vesicles and calcium ions play an important role in the process of release. So when the nerve impulse arrives to the nerve endings, it results in the release of neurotransmitters, which is called acetylcholine, from the vesicles. And the calcium ions play an important role in the process of release. The neurotransmitters cross the synaptic cleft when reaches the membrane. It leads to process of polarity and potential difference, making inside positive charge and outside negative charge. And the membrane is then said to be depolarized. In this case, we call it depolarized. These are changes due to the increase of permeability of muscle fiber membrane to sodium ions. This leads to muscle contraction. After a part of second, the muscle fiber membrane returns to normal, normal state, which is called repolarization. So when the muscle fiber returns back to its normal state, it's called repolarization. Due to the action of enzyme cholinesterase, which destroys acetylcholine to choline and acetate, the membrane 
returns to the resting state. I am going to explain the muscle uh, contraction. I mean, how can these systems coordinate all together? I mean, skeletal, nervous, and muscular system. Mechanism of muscle contraction, I am going to say the theory of sliding filaments. You have a theory about this muscle contraction called sliding filament or theory of sliding filament. This theory done by Higgsley. The theory of Higgsley depends on microscopic structure of the muscle fiber, which consists of myofibrils, and each consists of thin actin and myosin, as you see. After comparing a muscle fiber in a state of contraction with another fiber in a state of relaxation, the protein filaments slide over each other due to presence of transverse links. Observe with me, you can see these transverse links extended from the myosin and attached to the actin. In presence of calcium ions and energy, the transverse links act as hooks that pull the actin from both sides toward each other, leading to muscle contraction. Thank you for good listening. Until we meet again, good luck and goodbye.